name is Heather South, and I am an archivist with the Culture and Heritage Commission. Um, but basically, I work for the State Archives. We just opened up a branch in Asheville a few years ago, and so I run that branch up in Asheville. And um, over the years, uh, I have learned a lot of things about archives and history and preservation. And But my preservation is a little bit different. I'm not about buildings. I'm not about property. But I'm about the memories, the documents, the stories. Um, just, just being here for a few days, people have been like rifling in their pocketbooks, bringing out snapshots, yearbooks, and it makes my heart hurt. Stop! Um, do not pass those around. They just had French fries. Um, so the idea is that uh, over the years, it's become very evident that uh, you know 90% of history is still in private hands. It's in attics and basements. It's in drawers. It's under beds. And the idea is that we don't really have any clue on how to take care of our own treasures. Um, and especially if you're doing a Rosenwald project, you're gathering information from the public. You're getting new photographs, you're getting documents, you're getting copies of things. And so um, I do a lot of outreach to a lot of different groups on basic preservation, and that's what we're going to talk about. When I first started doing this kind of workshop, it started out being um, a, a bag of bad habits, <laughs> and then it became a box of bad habits, and now it's a trunk of trouble. And uh, if it gets any bigger, I'm just not doing it anymore. No. Um, and I mean, I could talk and I could do a PowerPoint. Um, I could tell you about archival theory. I could bore you with details of the science behind conservation. But uh, one, you'll sleep because it's after lunch. And two, you'll never remember most of it. So I have developed this trunk of props and make a fool of myself and then you'll remember. It's very exciting. Uh, my mom is so proud. Uh, so the number one issue that we have when we are dealing with archival materials, um, be they uh, photographs, books, paper, postcards, uh, diaries, ledgers, is about how we handle things, right? Um, and the idea is that we kind of take documents and archival material for granted. We'll just sort of put them in a drawer or we'll rifle through them. I've seen people using photographs as bookmarks. Um, <laughs> my mom. Um, uh, the idea is that we sort of have Paper is very prolific. We get, we get paper, we get documents in the mail every day. Um, and so we don't really know what to do. And we sort of just, just shove it aside a lot of times. And we don't really know how to handle our best or our most treasured items. And so handling is a big deal. And we cause a lot of damage uh, by mishandling our records. And one of the things, uh, glove or not to glove, that's the question. <laughs> in the archive world, there's a big debate. Now on television and in movies, you'll see people in the white cotton gloves, right? And they're handling artifacts and they're, you know, Oh, they're looking so serious, oh, right? A, oh, I've got, you know, do not touch that document without having your proper clothes on. Um, the idea for us is that um, we're really basically trying to prevent the oils in our hands from transferring. We have natural oils, and every time we touch, we actually leave behind a part of us. We leave behind residue. If that doesn't make you a germaphobe, nothing will. Um, but the idea is that any time I touch, I'm leaving behind oils. And that's a problem because have you ever checked out a book at the library and it's and, and it's got so dirty because of everyone checking it out has have their oils everybody holds the book in the same plot places and so it attracts dirt and mold and that speeds up the deterioration of the paper. Um, it can also, depending on what it's attracting, be delicious to bugs. Um, so the idea is that we want to try and prevent our, our oils. Now, does that mean you need to wear gloves all the time when you're handling artifacts? Not necessarily. Good soap and water and good clean hands is a good rule of thumb. The reason why is because if I'm handling something that's fragile and I've actually, um, and and I've got these, I've lost some of my dexterity, right? And I can't, so I may actually cause more damage. The other thing is to be mindful about handling is that inevitably, when we're passing around our photographs and memories, we're at reunions, we're at family gatherings, we're at church gatherings, um, and we're passing around family albums or photographs, and everybody's probably eating food, uh, and everybody, and so, you know, oh, y'all, look at this, and it starts getting passed around, and so then you have lots of little grubby handprints um, all over your treasures, and it, uh, even though you might not see it now, it'll start to manifest over time, and so we want to be more conscious about how we handle things. Good clean hands and also 
I typically try and use gloves, either latex gloves or cotton gloves, when I'm handling negatives or photographs, simply because the emulsion layer, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about photographs in a little bit, um, can actually, you'll have fingerprints that'll start, the, the ridges will actually appear uh, if the emulsion layer is sort of soft. And so um, we typically try and use gloves when we're handling photographs. But um, you can't always, you don't always have your gloves. I mean, I always carry mine in my pocketbook, but not everybody does that because I'm special. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, you know, just good clean hands. And you can even use hand sanitizer. If you don't, if you're in a field, um, and if you're out and people have brought something to you and you're not prepared, um, a lot of times, especially if you're, uh, you know, doing a Rosenwald project, people might just stop you somewhere. Oh, I wanted you to see this. And, you know, you don't really have your supplies or you don't have anything with you. The idea is hand sanitizer, the kind that doesn't have the emollients in it uh, to make it all nice and, and smooth. And you want to make sure they're dry after you use it. Um, simply, that's all it's doing is getting away some of the dirt and debris so that when you touch items, it's not going to fall apart. Um, so handling is a big concern. The other concern that we have is temperature and humidity in our storage environments. How many of you, no, we won't, <laughs> they're filming, we won't ask you this on film. Um, or I'll close my eyes, y'all tell me. How many of you have stuff in your attics? How many people have stuff in barns, basements? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the problem with that is that the temperature fluctuates far too much in those areas. Even though they're designed for storage, the idea is that we put stuff there because it's supposed to be stored. Um, the attic, that's where we put stuff. Basement, that's where we put stuff. But the fluctuation in the temperature and humidity is what speeds up the deterioration of our documents and photographs. So paper is organic. It breathes. And it's going to expand and contract with differences in temperature and humidity. And so if it's warm and humid, welcome to the south, um, it's going to actually expand and absorb that moisture. If it's cold and, uh, and dry, it's going to contract. That's why you'll see a lot of letters or tri-folded court cases split at those folds because when you fold a piece of paper, you've weakened it. And as it expands and contracts, it's going to break at its weakest point. So the idea is that, you know, we can't store everything in our, our homes. I understand that you can't pull everything into the interior room of your house um, unless you're a hoarder, <laughs> and even then that has some problems. Um, but the idea is that you want to be able to take your most treasured items and put them in an interior room of your home, and that's twofold. One, we typically keep a nice, even keel climate in our homes. It might not be ideal. Um, archival theory says that it should be about 68 degrees and 50% humidity for paper. Hey, crazy. Um, that's not very impossible, unless you've got lots of money to pay an electric bill, um, and your HVAC is running as little fast as it can go. The idea is that we can't really maintain that realistically. But what we want to try and do is bring it into where there's not this roller coaster effect. So like this time of year, when we have some crazy high temperatures in the daytime, and then it gets kind of cooler at night. And so it's this sort of roller coaster effect. And that's what's going to speed up that breaking and speed up that breakdown of the paper. So the idea is that if we bring our sort of more treasured items interior room, it's going to be more even keel. It's not going to have that roller coaster. Um, I myself am scared of roller coaster so that's good. Um, so your paper is too. Okay. Um, so the idea is that we want to be monitoring our temperature and humidity. Um, the other problem with humidity is that you can start to have a mold and mildew issue. Um, you can be the cleanest housekeeper in the world. You can clean all day long, and, but mold spores are everywhere. They just need the right climate to grow, and that's warm and moist. And so especially if we're storing things in a basement or an attic, we may not see that we have a problem happening with our records before it's too late. Um, mold will actually start to disintegrate the paper faster. It discolors it. Um, it will eat away um, at, the, at the documents. It's, it's almost like um, when you feed yeast to bread, right? And it's just the feeder mix, um, and you're feeding it, and you're trying to make the dough grow. It's the same kind of thing. It's growing off of your papers, and the mold just continues to grow and grow and grow. So by keeping it interior room, uh, climate control is controlled, but also you can kind of keep an eye on things. Um, you don't have to see it all the time, but I can't tell you how many times we go and, you know, we have mold. Well, how often do you check it? Um, 
Were you supposed to check it? <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're storing out of sight, out of mind, and a lot of times community projects, you'll have a centralized storage. You'll put it in a storage unit sometimes, or in an office space, or maybe part of the city has a space, or the, or the county has something, and you've stored stuff away, but you're not checking it regularly, then that becomes a problem, because you're really not being mindful of what's happening to your documents and your photographs. Is it climate controlled? And if it is, is it truly climate controlled? Or is it like a lot of government buildings, they turn the AC and they turn things off on holidays and weekends because it's nobody's there, so they're not going to run the electricity, right? So we have to be more mindful of storage and where we're putting things. And all this sort of seems like common sense stuff, right? And it's really preservation. There is a science to it, and I'm not trying to under, undersell uh, restoration and conservation of documents. I mean, it, there is a science to it. But the idea is that for us, and we, there's a lot of practical things that we can do that don't break the bank, um, and that if we just sort of retrain our thought processes about preservation and what we're doing and how we handle. So I always tell people that we want to use our senses. So we're going to touch, right? But we're going to have clean hands when we touch. Uh, we're going to use our sight. We're going to keep an eye on things. Uh, we want to make sure. We want to feel the air and the environment. Um, I don't recommend licking anything, though, y'all, because um, it is gross. Uh, I'm just telling you, don't do it. Um, but the other thing is we want to smell, too. If you smell something out of the ordinary, how many of you go and you get the Christmas ornaments or you get the decorations out of the attic or you go and grab the quilt and you smell something? It's either it's just sort of... It's not fresh smelling, or it may smell like mildew, or it's so you're using your senses. Obviously, something's breaking down. Um, one of the things that we do, often do is we store in sort of those plastic totes a lot of times, and when you open them, do you smell? Um, it's because all the off-gassing. Everything's breaking down. We're all off-gassing. <laughs> uh, um, we all are. Um, but the idea is that the smell is contracted, uh, it's trapped in a container that has a seal, uh, a lid, like a Rubbermaid tub or a Sterlite tote. And so when we open those decorations or we get out the wreath for the next holiday, it's going to have that breakdown. So everything's breaking down. So we want to make sure that we have good airflow happening. And a lot of times that's not going to happen in a closet or it's not going to happen in an attic. Um, now, I myself have... It's hard. I get it. Uh, I inherited a lot of family photographs and a lot of documents. Um, it's hard to practice what you preach. So um, I have... <laughs> um, I don't know, I'll tell y'all. I have Rubbermaid tubs with photos in them. I know, bad archivist. Um, but the idea is that I haven't left them completely stored with the lid closed. I actually have vented all the lids. Um, and so if you have no option but you have to store in those, making sure that you get some airflow is important and crucial. Um, the other sense that we want to do is we want to smell things out of the ordinary. So if you had a leak, um, you're going to smell wet cardboard or you're going to smell something a little bit funky. You're going to smell mold. You're going to smell mildew. I can't tell you how many times I've been called out and, you know, we've had this pipe leak. Man, it's terrible. And we start talking to people and then all of a sudden it didn't just happen. You know, we've been smelling wet cardboard for a couple of weeks now, but why didn't you check it out? Um, you could have saved yourself so much trouble. Um, so sometimes we're just sort of, I don't want to say we're lazy. We're not lazy, but we've just got so much going on. It's hard to be on top of everything. So if you can just sort of make it almost secondhand nature or store your treasured items in an interior room of your home under the guest room bed. You don't have to go in that guest room on an often basis, but you can just kind of take a look every once in a while. Make sure the dust bunnies are making friends. No, um, the, the idea is that you want to try and be mindful and be uh, looking, smelling, seeing what's going on with your collections. Okay, so <clears throat> we've talked a lot about that. The next big issue that we have is about uh, when we display items. And inevitably, we're going to have a reunion, we're going to put things out on a table, or we're going to have people over, and we're going to put things on the wall, or we're going to frame things and put them in the schoolhouse, right? Um, and the problem with that is that we start to expose our records to UV light. Right? When we go outside on a sunny day, we put on sunglasses. If we're going to be out working in the yard, we'll wear a floppy hat, right? Or we'll put on sunscreen. And that's because UV light damage is cumulative. It builds up over time. And it is irreversible. So the damage caused can't be undone. And what it's doing to paper and photographs, it causes fading. It causes the paper to become brittle. 
it causes discoloration. Um, how many of you have left a newspaper out for a few days on the driveway and it's really yellow, right, after just a day or two? That's the UV light. Newsprint, uh, newsprint right now is really cheaply made and so it has a lot of acidity in it. And so if that sunshine hits it, it's going to start turning it yellow almost immediately. So the idea is that we want to be mindful of UV light. So um, I go into a lot of places and especially Rosenwald schools have these nice, wonderful big windows. Um, but the UV light is going to stream in, it's going to fade the floor, it's going to fade the paints, it's going to fade anything you put on the wall that's going to have direct sunlight on it. So you have to sort of be mindful. Now, does that mean you need to run out and buy a light meter? No. What you can do, and these are, this is, I'm all about cheap and inexpensive ways to think. Um, because Lord knows, archives, we hard pressed for cash too. Um, it's not just building rehabs uh, that need money. So the idea is that you can use a piece of construction paper because the color is not as color fast. So this is actually off a bulletin board. Um, and this didn't have sunlight, this was just fluorescent lighting. Um, so over time, it's going to start to fade out. So one of the things you can do, and you can do this at home, is if you have something framed on the wall, stick a piece of construction paper half behind the frame and half out. And after a week, take it out and see if you have a tide line. And if you have this tie line, and the tie line I mean is like where you can see that it's faded, then you may have UV exposure. Maybe this time of year the sunlight streams in differently uh, over that living room wall that you have all your great grandmother's, you know, baptismal certificates and the marriage licenses and things and the photographs on the wall. So the idea is that um, one of the things we recommend is you can frame surrogates or copies and never be the wiser. Um, and it always is it's great and then you don't have to worry about it uh, so this is actually just a color photocopy uh, on regular just standard copy paper it's not anything special and once you get it in a frame it's really hard to tell that it's not the original and so um, we recommend using surrogates or um, you can get UV glass or UV shields uh, to go on the front of framed items. Um, but really and truly, I mean, until you think about the sunlight or the UV light affecting your documents and things, you really, you really don't. I mean, it's, it's sort of taken for granted a lot of times. This comes into play also with textiles. Um, so if you have your great-grandmother's quilt uh, laying across the bed, um, sunlight can actually start to fade out and damage those textiles as well. Yes, ma'am. Any kind of UV light. So uh, even if sunlight's not directly streaming on it, um, it's going to have some effect. If, if it's not directly, then it's, it's a lot lessened and it's not as detrimental. But if it's um, anything direct, is going to be a major issue. Um, and a lot of times you go into libraries or any kind of governmental building, they have fluorescent lights uh, because that's, the bulbs are cheaper, it's easier. And so in the archives, we're a government agency, we have fluorescent lights. But we put UV shields on all of our bulbs. So there can be stopgap measures and things that you can do inexpensively to fix a problem. You just sort of have to think outside the box. And I think Rosenwald projects, you're already thinking outside the box anyway. You're fighting uphill battle for funding, for support. And so the idea is that even if you're uh, collecting archival materials for your project or your school, or even if it's just your personal collections, this material, you know, you just sort of have to think outside the box sometimes. Um, sometimes you also have to think inside the box. <laughs> um, so that's a good segue. Man, that was genius. Um, no. Um, these kinds of boxes, these are sort of, you can get these at any kind of craft store, uh, AC Moore, Hobby Lobby, uh, Michaels, and these are photo safe boxes and they're designed for storage. Um, and so they're great because you can put your photographs in here, postcards, letters, gloves, um, small artifacts can go into these boxes. Um, they make them in a variety of, of um, designs so they, they will go with your own decorating style. They can go in the bookcase or in my case they line under the bed in the guest room. Y'all if you ever come to my house do not look under the guest room bed, okay? Um, it's scary. Um, but the idea is that this is actually a good storage solution and it's inexpensive. If we were to try and go and buy archival boxes, ideally in the ideal world, everything would be in these nice archival. These, what makes something archival? I guess I should say that. Archival means <clears throat> that it is acid free. What we're fighting is the acidity in the paper is breaking down. That's what's causing it to break down, become brittle, become browned, become yellowed. So um, we're fighting against the acidity, and it's actually the wood lignans um, out of the wood pulp. Um, the other problem that we're fighting is that the environment, um, just being exposed to the environment speeds up deterioration. And so these boxes are archival, they're acid free, um, they're, they basically are inert, they're not going to interact with your items inside. They give good protection, they block the UV light, um, but a box like this, if you're just buying one or two, they're probably $12 a piece, right? 
right? It starts to add up really quick, and that budget that you had for supplies is out the window. So as a good stopgap measure, these boxes, uh, they run them on sale, they're like $1.60. Um, and you, I buy them in bulk. Um, I use these for postcards in my archive um, because they're great. You can put tabs in them um, and it allows you to kind of sort and know what, you, maybe you have them school photos by year in there. Um, but it allows you to sort of organize and keep, uh, keep things straight without a lot of manhandling um, and a, without a lot of expense. The other thing that goes into a box, ideally, in the archive world, is that it would go into an archival folder. Archival folder, again, this is going to be buffered. Meaning, there's a pH scale. I, I don't do math and science very well. Um, history, I'm your girl. Um, but the idea is that uh, archival products actually help absorb some of the acidity of the contents. And so what you're looking for <clears throat> is that this is going to help absorb some of the, the stuff that's off-gassing. And it's going to, over time though, this has to be replaced and the box will have to be replaced. But it's, it's, it's supposed to be, um, it's, it's the way to conserve and preserve, right? Well, the problem is, is that this is probably a 60 cent folder. Well, that's not a whole lot, but when you start thinking if you've got, need 100, I mean, it starts to add up very fast. But a standard manila folder from your office supply store like this guy here that we can all get, right? These are actually neutral. So these don't do, they do not interact. So if all you can afford right now are some manila folders um, and a filing cabinet, then that's all you need. And you've done, you've done great lengths at preservation. Um, and the problem is, is that, um, you know, this isn't a long-term fix, but it allows you to fundraise or it's at least maybe at least for me, now, now this is being filmed, so don't let my superiors see this, but um, for the really historical items, for the stuff that's that one-of-a-kind thing, that one image that you've not been able to find that surfaces, then I'm going to go to the expense and I'm going to actually do more archival housing, right? But if it's just a lot of copies or if they're reproductions and people are giving me things, then I may be judicious in what I use my archival supplies on, right? And you can use these kinds of things as a stopgap measure and it doesn't break the bank. Um, the other thing to consider is that uh, archival, museum quality, acid free have become marketing terms much like uh, no trans fat or 30% more, it's only one more cookie. You know, as a fat girl, one more cookie is not 30% more. Um, so the idea is that uh, we want to be more mindful of reading the labels. Don't just say that it's archival. Look at the label. What does it say? Has it passed a uh, photo activity test? Is it lignin free? Um, what kinds of, what are the sort of schematics? What is the pH of the product? Most of the time, if you can purchase it at uh, places that are like Walmart, Target, Office Depot, places like that, it's probably not archival. Um, it's probably going to be more office supply. Now, that's not to say there aren't things there, but the idea is that there are, you have to be more mindful about the products you're using. A lot of times people will, um, uh, here's a great one, this is more about photographs. Um, how many of you have albums that are these wonderful magic magnetic albums people. Um, yeah, we all do, right? So they actually still sell these magnetic albums. There's absolutely nothing magnetic about these. It literally is an album with adhesive strips, okay? There's no such thing as archival glue. Um, there's water soluble and there's more things that are archival friendly. Um, but sometimes, I mean, the glue that's used in these albums is insanely strong. Um, but they still sell these and they're marketed as archival. But don't use them, don't fall for that trick. Um, they will suck you in like 30% more. Um, the idea is that you want to be more mindful and, and think about it in terms of, so yeah, the paper might be archival, the book itself may be archival and acid free, but you know good and well that this adhesive is going to stick to everything. The other problem with this is, what do we talk about the rubber totes, right? Those little plastic, what happens? We're sealing in all the bad stuff. So if I put photos and I put this plastic sheet right on top, what have I done? sealed in all the bad stuff, right? And so um, it's going to continue to degrade and photos are going to turn orange or they're going to turn purple, which I like purple so that's okay. No, um, and that is the degradation of the color processing of photographs. Now photographs are a whole other sort of entity and they are a little, I want to take some time because 
Um, yesterday, I saw a lady c coming up with those snapshots out of her pocketbook, and, and I was like, here's my card. You need to call me. Um, the idea is that uh, we sort of take photos for granted, and um, but photos are actually three different layers. Um, there is a backer layer. Sometimes that's going to be paper. Sometimes it's cardboard. Sometimes it's um, metal. Sometimes if it's artsy, sometimes it's a paper sack. It just depends on what they had available. But every photo has a backer. The next layer is the emulsion layer or the binder layer. And that binder layer is what's going to keep the third layer, the image, attached. Um, now the image layer can be things like pigment, it can be inks, um, that emulsion layer um, can be different types of chemicals, but there's also things, albumin prints, that was egg wash, and that was what kept items, um, kept the image. Uh, early black and white photography is going to be more silver um, and gelatin oriented. Um, and if one thing happens to any one of these layers, so I mean, we're talking about um, a photograph uh, you know, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. Um, this, this, this whole three, this sandwich is in something this, this thin, right? And so the idea is if, if something happens to the backer, well, there's no sense keeping it, it's nothing to sit on it. If something happens to the image layer, well, why do you keep the backer? Um, if something happens to the emulsion layer and it goes, there's no, nothing for the image. So really, they're extremely fragile. Um, and we sort of take them for granted. Early black and white photographs uh, tend to hold up over time a lot better. It's when we start introducing the color photography that there's a lot more chemicals involved. Now, my, this is, <laughs> I was so cute, but now, um, you know, uh, we all, you know, our parents would scrimp and save and take us to Olin Mills um, and get our professional photography done, right? And every last one of my baby pictures has done this because it's just the way the color is breaking down over time. And we're still worrying now in archives, we're testing all these new inkjet printers and laser jet printers. How long will these digital pictures that we're taking last if we print them out? Um, and so it's a big issue. But inevitably, you're going to have folks bringing you photographs. And the best way to kind of store these is, one, I'm going to handle them with care. And two, I'm going to use something like this or I'm going to create sleeves um, for my photographs. Um, so they sell sleeves um, made out of mylar. This is uh, mylar. It's also called Milanex. It's, um, it's basically an inert polyester film. It's also the only good excuse to use static electricity. Uh, static electricity will actually support the photos inside. Um, and they make them, um, and this allows me to have storage. Um, it allows me to see the image, but the problem is, is that these also start getting very costly. Um, so um, the idea is that maybe for that one discovered item, uh, I was in on the Girl Scout session yesterday, Julie, um, is it Brock? Um, Bray, um, she, and, and in her research, they never had a picture and she found one. Someone had one, uh, the class photo from 1934, I think. And so once you find that, then yes, I'm going to put that very highly unique and prized item into the archival sleeve. But if it's not, and if it's just something, it's run-of-the-mill snapshot that we have a million of, then I may just actually choose to use just a standard piece of copy paper, which is also neutral. Okay. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to fold and I'm going to make myself a little pocket so that if I were to put this just down into a folder, it's going to flop around and it could fall out and be a problem. But if I make it its own little custom little housing, uh, then I've got, it's, it's more secure. The idea is that we all like to, you know, well, maybe not some people. My mom does not like to be hugged. <laughs> it's a space thing. Um, but we all like a little support every once in a while, right? And so our documents and paper are the same way. If we were to just throw something down into a box, then what's going to happen, right? It's going to, it's going to wear and tear. But if we give it a little extra support and give it a little hug, um, then it's going to have a little bit more protection from handling. The other thing that comes up a lot of times is about labeling photographs. Now, in this case, they were very, very nice to let us know what event it was and they even put a date on it. Unfortunately, they wrote it right across smack dab the middle of the pack. And so this actually, uh, the ink spread through to the front. Um, at basically obliterating uh, the image and making it a problem. So, um, if you have photos that are already labeled on the back, there's nothing you can do to undo that. You're just going to slow it down and hopefully protect it from bleed through. The other thing is that we're going to not write on new photographs. 
don't do it. Um, or if you want to do it, you're going to use more things like a Pigma pen. You can get them in the scrapbooking section. You're not going to use a roller pen. You're not going to use a gel pen. You're going to use something with, a, and you're not going to bear down. Because if you bear down, you're going to push through and ruin some of those layers. But the idea is that you're going to label it maybe off in a margin, maybe in the tree line, maybe in the skyline, but not where it's going to actually start to bleed through and affect the people's faces. Um, the other thing I've seen people, there is no wrong system. It's whatever's going to work best for you. If you want to organize all of your photographs this way, great. If you want to create um, a tab system and maybe just put a number and have an index, great. Um, if you just want to keep your prized ones in a box and have a, a, a sheet that labels what everything is, great. Inevitably, though, what you guys will be running into with your Rosenwald, you'll have class photos. And people, I would recommend making color copies. And so then people can write all over those color copies. You can say, I think this is so-and-so. Oh, I remember him. That's, that's Johnny Murphy. Um, so you can write all over those, and then those become part of your archival documentation along with this photograph. Does that make sense? And it seems really easy, but it's really easy to take them for granted. Um, the other thing um, about photographs and storage, using our senses again, right? Um, <clears throat> if you get a photo album, the best kind of photo album, by the way, not magnetic, um, is ones with pockets that are easily undone, um, ones that you can kind of, um, sometimes they'll have two or three pockets on a page and then a, a tab for writing information. This is the kind of thing you want to look for, the pockets. In the archives world, um, it's kind of like the Hippocratic Oath for Doctors, we do no harm, right? Um, the idea is that we want to do uh, what our best to be good stewards of the documents, but we don't want anything that can't easily be undone. Years ago, we would use a process called encapsulation, and you've probably seen the early court records and things, or the minutes that'll be sort of in this like rice paper, and they're kind of you can still read them, but they're really funky looking. And but that's not easily undone anymore. The other problem we run into is that people think they've preserved items by going and taking them and getting them laminated. Right? Lamination is evil. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, because all you're doing is creating a little microclimate, and once that document is in and adhered to that plastic lamination, it's just going to continue to disintegrate and turn to mush on the inside and there's nothing you can do to undo it. Now, if you already have stuff that's laminated, just good proper storage and trying to make sure you store it in a good climate. It's not that, you know, everything's not going to disintegrate overnight, but we've got to be a little bit more sort of um, proactive in long-term preservation of our documents. So, you're going to look for pockets. The other thing you're going to do, um, so far I've not been arrested and I've been doing this for years, um, is you want to sniff albums. Now, I have been threatened to be taken to the funny farm, but um, the idea is that if I smell a heavy plastic, like a fresh beach ball or a brand new Barbie doll, um, that means it's a bad PVC plastic. It's a heavy plasticizer. Same thing goes with those little sheet protectors that you can buy. If it smells like plastic, then it's bad. Um, that, <laughs> skull and crossbones. No, don't use it. Um, and um, I'm in many estates sniffing photo albums. <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> um, um, and, but the idea is that that's, I'm using my senses, right? I'm trying to slow down. And that's one thing I think we rush ahead with a lot of times, that we feel the, the sort of this, we've got to get this project done. Oh my gosh, we've got the reunion. We've got to get all these pictures. We've got to get them going. We've got to get this album finished. And we really need to take a step back and figure out what we're doing to our items. Inevitably, it's the last secretary standing ends up with this box of stuff. They don't know where it came from. They don't know anything about it. So the idea is that we've got to just try and be, um, take our time. And it's not that you can wait all day, but you need to just be more mindful and make arrangements and think about uh, your records um, as you move forward in your projects. Um, I've got some other troubles that I want to talk about. Do you have any questions right now? Everybody good? Everybody learning? Good. Okay. Um, if at any point I have gone too fast or out of control, let me know. Um, like I said, uh, funny farm. <laughs> um, I don't know if they make a straight jacket, but it's got shiny buckles. It'll be fine. Um, so cleaning documents and things. Well, inevitably, stuff you'll get or somebody will bring you something and it'll be a little dirty. It might have been stored out in the shed for a while. Um, or it might just have dirt and debris on it. A soft bristle brush is the way to go. Um, you can do this with books. You can do this um, not necessarily with photographs. But with paper, you can definitely do it. You're going to use a light touch. You're going to go away from the spine of books. You're just going to do a light touch across there, um, especially with yearbooks. You'll find a lot of times they've been stored, and they might have um, 
bug debris, <laughs> i.e. Uh, bug poop. It's very sexy, my job, I know. Um, uh, and so the idea is that I'm gonna use a soft bristle brush and I'm gonna get away and brush this away. You'll do that on outside on a nice day with a breeze uh, so that you're not ingesting that. Um, but the idea is that it's easy fix and all you're trying to do is get away some of that surface dirt to remove some of the temptations for bugs but also to remove some of the, the staining that can happen with dirt and debris left on documents. Um, the other problem that we run into uh, Right? Uh, anybody have these things in your house? Right? Um, you mean everybody have little critters, right? It doesn't matter how clean our house is, it doesn't matter, uh, we got bugs. And in the South, we grow bugs big. Um, and we have to be mindful. That's another reason why we don't store away from site, is because we can have an infestation problem very quickly and not know it. Um, and it's not necessarily that they're enjoying the paper, but sometimes they enjoy the stuff that's on the paper. So this is actually uh, damage done by roach. Um, this is called roaching, and um, yeah, I know, my job is sexy, y'all. Um, that is, they're, they're actually not eating the page, they're not eating the book cloth, they're eating the starches and the adhesives out of the book cloth. It's like chocolate. And once they find a smorgasbord, they're inviting all their friends. Um, this is another good example here somewhere. Any guesses? Termites. Yeah, you can have a termite infestation in your archives and in your documents because it's made out of paper and wood, right? Um, and so uh, if you don't keep a check on things, you can have an infestation. So bugs are an issue, but we also have other critters to worry about, right? Squirrels, raccoons, lizards. <laughs> they don't necessarily eat it, but they shred it for their nests. And let me tell you, you ain't lived until you've cleaned out mouse poop out of a collection. Oh, it's just so glamorous. Um, no, but the idea is that we, that's, we have to be more mindful, right? Um, and, and it's not that you can keep everything from happening, uh, but the idea is that you can just prevent a lot of things from happening. We just tweak our mindset just a smidgen. All right, so the other kind of troubles we have, photographs. Um, they'll eat the emulsion, yeah. Cleaning photographs. So um, if I were to try and scrape across a photograph, what's gonna happen is um, I can scratch that layer so um, if it's really dirty, uh, you can try and use a soft bristle brush on the back side. Um, and, um, and then I, that's where I would use my cotton gloves, wherever they, oh, they're in my back pocket. No, nope, I don't know what, I threw them away. Um, they're here somewhere. Oh, me and my props, oh my God. Um, the idea is that um, you can actually try and wipe a little surface dirt. Most photographs, if it's something that's a rare item, you can actually seek conservator help on how to conserve it and how to clean it a lot better. Um, this, is, this, this photograph, for example, um, I could put it in water uh, because it was a wet process. You've seen on TV, all the, right? But then the inks are gonna continue to bleed, so I can't really do it in water. So there's a lot of factors involved. So um, if it's really disgusting, put it in a sleeve to keep it isolated. That adage about one bad apple will spoil the whole bunch. If I've got a photo that's really gnarly and really bad, um, like this one, for example, it's, you can see the pool of the chemicals where it was misprocessed. If I stored that next to something that's pristine or nice, it's gonna transfer over time. Same thing with documents, it happens the same way. If I've got something that has a mold issue and I put it in with stuff that doesn't have mold, you better believe that mold spore is gonna, it's gonna transfer, yeah. Um, it depends. Um, the, yeah, the compressed air, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> compressed air is good. Um, if you don't know and you haven't found the luxury of compressed air, um, what, those fake plants in your house, <laughs> they're really great with compressed air. It just pff, dust goes away. Um, but the idea is, if you're going to use compressed air, it's actually uh, extremely cold. It's like a, a, a compressed nitrogen, and when it comes out, it's extremely cold. So if you have gotten too close to an item, it can actually leave behind um, condensation and residue. So I typically don't use compressed air on the archival materials. Sometimes if I've got a very problematic spine or, or I think there's a problem, I might use some compressed air. But by and large for my stuff, I just use a nice clean touch. And if I can, um, most of the time though, photos aren't too, too bad. They might be really gnarly around the edges, especially if they're mounted to cardboard. The edges will get really disgusting. Those you can kind of sweep and clean, but it's the photo itself, you really can't clean too much on it. Um, it's a lot, lot of issue. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, they discolor and they um, 
they tarnish, uh, like the tintypes and the things on metals that we're talking about. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to stop that process. We can slow it down uh, in good proper storage. You can actually, in you know, the digital age is great in a lot of ways because you can scan those and do a lot of contrast manipulation sometimes and change the angles uh, of some of the light exposure and sometimes you can bring out a very good picture. Um, but inevitably, um, those kinds of early photographic materials are, are so volatile, um, especially uh, on metal, because they're dealing with oxidization and, and, um, and corrosion from the metal itself. Um, early uh, albumin prints are the same way. The, the egg wash is breaking down, um, and so we're, you know, you're fighting a losing battle sometimes. Um, but then, hey, look, archival rules are meant to be broken sometimes, y'all. Um, even though there's theory and methodology books, and, and you guys, there's preservation books too, every once in a while you find that diamond in the rough. You find that rule breaker, and you can't believe it that it's happened, right? Um, and or that that Rosenwald School is still standing. Um, you know, how did it survive all this time? It's just out here. Um, no one knew it. No one, you know. And so there, there are, there are um, magical moments sometimes in the archives, too. Um, I just recently opened a time capsule. Time capsules, by their very nature, do not really survive uh, because uh, they have it's subjected to the exterior environment. They inevitably get flooded. They have bug damage. They have mold damage. And usually there might be a sliver or two that's salvageable. We opened one that was 118 years old, and every bit of it was salvageable. Why? I don't know. So do you have a best practices kind of rule sheet uh, for opening a time castle, seek a professional. <laughs> um, if you're going to open one, just know uh, up front that you're, you're probably going to run into issues. In fact, I'll show you. This is what typically happens in a time capsule, y'all, um, because everything is going to turn into a block, and it's all going to stick together. Um, this is a time capsule. Um, nothing's really salvageable. It's all stuck together. Um, in one solid block. I could try and soak um, and we could try and remove items, but at this point it's just going to be little slivers. Um, inevitably this is what's going to happen to time capsules. What we recommend folks do is just go in with an open mind and know that if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. Is this worth keeping? Well, it depends on the time capsule it came out of. For us, it wasn't. It's because it's nothing historically. We can't even read anything here. Um, but, like I said, rules sometimes are meant to be broken. Inevitably, uh, a lot of churches um, and a lot of rededications of schools and things will try and do time capsules. So the good rule of thumb is to do two. Um, one, you put in the actual time capsule, and the other you put in an archive, in archival sound. Make, a, you know, make an arrangement with a local archive, a county archive. Um, uh, I know in Transylvania County here in North Carolina, the local schools all did time capsules. And so they're lining the shelves of their archival in the library, in the Public Library Carolina room, so that they have those time capsules that will be open 50 years from now um, for the students. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, uh, there's also an adage in the archives about lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, I am all for, you know, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, we get to, uh, we get really sentimental about an item, a photograph or a book or um, uh, a document, and we're kind of like, no one can look at it. Um, no one knows. Um, but the idea is that we want to have open accessibility. We want people to see these. We want people to be educated by it. We want people to explore those images and get information from it. So you, didn't, you may have looked at something 100 times, and the first time I look at it, I may see something you've never even spotted before. Fresh eyes, right? So the idea is that we want to try and make it as accessible as possible. So putting another copy, then that still has the interest. You can just, you know, it's almost like a backup. Uh, but like I said, sometimes rules are meant to be broken. Um, so it's good. Why, it, why stuff survives and it doesn't, I don't know. The rule of thumb is if you don't have good airflow and you have high humidity and high uh, temperature, you'll have mold within 48 hours. So after a storm, um, on a hurricane, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, after uh, Hurricane Sandy up in New York, 48-hour window before you have mold growth, right? Well, but some people went back after weeks and had no mold. So there is no sometimes rhyme or reason. It's kind of like when a tornado hits and it jumps, jumps different uh, houses. There's no rhyme or reason sometimes. Sometimes it's just meant to be. Um, so that's one of the things I've learned in archives is that even though there's a trunk of trouble and there's a lot of things we can avoid, sometimes you can't plan for everything, but then sometimes you're just pleasantly surprised. Um, I've also learned that uh, <laughs> if you're going to open a box that somebody brought you and you don't know where it's been stored, always tap the box first before you open it. Let things jump out before you go <laughs> to open it. Um, if you have a weak heart, especially let somebody else open it. <laughs> um, uh, it can be very gnarly at times. 
The other issues that we run into, and some of the troubles I want to address, are about some of our office supply issues. Rubber bands. Um, that's one. We always are grabbing that rubber band and we're putting it around a stack of stuff, right? Um, and what's the problem with a rubber band? It breaks, right? It's also going to degrade over time, and it's also putting undue pressure on these outside points. So even if it's not your historical records, let's just say it's your minutes from your board, right? And you've got all your board minutes and all your notes that you've been taking from this conference, and you stick them like this. What's going to happen over time is that you're going to start to break and tear into your documents. So we try and tell folks to avoid rubber bands. If you need to keep a group of papers together, a folder is a great way to do that. Um, rubber bands will actually disintegrate, um, and I have an example of one. Um, this actually wasn't around a document, but it got down in a fold, and so you can see that it left behind the residue of the rubber that's broken down. There's nothing I can do to remove that staining, it's done. Right? So we want to make sure that we try and eliminate some of these office supply issues that we have. Um, and rubber bands, that's easy to remove, right? All right. Another problem that we have, um, staples right? and paper clips. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put my eye out one day. Um, the idea is we have staples and paper clips, right? Now, does that mean you have to go and remove every metal fastener known to man? In the ideal world, you would. No. <laughs> But what's going to happen over time is that it's going to actually rust and corrode, um, and you're going to have major issues. Um, with four, um, I can't find my, this is the problem, we have too many things. Um, pay no attention to the crazy lady behind the trunk. Um, Eh, it's here somewhere. It's in the pile. Um, the idea is that when we have metal fasteners, they're going to corrode. And especially, um, maybe not overnight, but they're going to start leaving behind rust. Much like our porch furniture. You know, we buy a nice iron chair or we, the car gets rust underneath the bottom. The same thing is going to happen to paper, clips, staples, brads, fasteners, anything metal. And especially um, sometimes if they didn't have a paper clip or a brad, um, they would use a straight pin or bobby pins. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things used. So anything that's metal is going to corrode over time. Does that mean you have to remove everything? No. But you want to try and limit how many, especially in your more modern uses of staples. So if you have a board meeting and you have a cover sheet, and then you have, uh, oh, I forgot to put the agenda, and then you start, you know, the idea is that you're going to start ending up putting lots of staples and things. Try to minimize the use and also put it in a corner um, or out of the reach of text so that if it corrodes and fades and is a problem, that it's not going to obliterate the information, that you can still read it. The other thing is when you remove staples, do not use these things. Um, I have never been successful. I, I'm just not, and I'm just really uh, clumsy. And, uh, and I guess these are beyond my mechanical capabilities. Uh, every time I use these, I end up doing a heck of a lot more damage, either to the paper or to the board. Um, I've actually clawed through a court board before. Um, <laughs> shh. Um, my sister shouldn't have invited me to help with her classroom. Anyway, um, so the idea is that we can cause a lot more damage using something like this, right? So we want to try and do something uh, a little bit more cautious. And so we're going to do, um, we can use, this is a micro spatula. Uh, this, is, this is a very fancy highfalutin archival tool, y'all. Um, this, is, this, is, this is $12 at the archival catalog. Or you can use a butter knife out of your kitchen drawer, right? The idea, or you can use a, a flathead screwdriver. It works the same thing. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to pry open the prongs of that staple, and then I can pull it out without causing more harm to that page. Same thing, a lot of times you'll get programs that are stapled in the middle, um, like especially like reunion programs and things that will have a staple in the middle. I can actually pry it open, pull it out, and then I can store the program without the staples. Because inevitably that, that rust will run everywhere. Um, so it's trying to be preventative and think about things. Does that mean you can, you can you know, think of everything? No, you can't. But little things, you can do a lot. Um, another office supply trouble that we run into. Da -da -da -da, scotch tape, right? I've already mentioned that there is no such thing as an archival adhesive, right? All tape is, is plastic with some goo on it. <laughs> um, this is good for wrapping presents. Um, I myself enjoy gift every once in a while. Now, um, and it's also good for, you know, uh, fixing that dollar bill, right? That gets torn because uh, it won't go in the vending machine. Um, but the idea is that all it's going to do over time is it's going to yellow. 
and it's going to become brittle and it's going to fall away and it's going to leave behind just that rectangle of goo. And so we don't want to use scotch tape on any documents. If you have documents that are ripped or torn, um, you're going to use a mylar sleeve or you're going to use a folder to keep the pieces together. You're not going to try and use tape to try and uh, repair it yourself because it, in the long run it causes a lot more damage. Um, and the idea is that you know tape is very convenient um, now but 50 years from now, uh, when you've got somebody trying to work on removing this tape um, from an archival document, it is a no-go. It's a problem. Um, the other issue that we run into, any questions? Yeah. Um, other office supply habits that are troubles. Um, Post-it notes, right? Um, Post-it note is great. I live by Post-it notes. I couldn't keep my life in order if I didn't have Post-it notes. But the idea, <laughs> And I don't do a very good job keeping in order either. Um, but the idea is that all this is, is it's got adhesives on it. So anything I put it on, be it a document, be it a photograph, it's going to leave behind some sort of residue. It may not be evident right now, but over time it'll start to attract dirt and dust. And so we want to try and make our notes um, on... Uh, on uh, you can just cut out a piece of standard copy paper to put in if you want to make notes. Make a Xerox of whatever it is you want to make notes on. Um, but try and avoid these post-it notes. Um, because also, too, over time, these are also going to let go. And especially if you've made a lot of notes in, uh, let's say, your conference uh, notebook. You went to a fundraising conference notebook, and you've got all these great tabs, and you put all this information in there, these are going to fall off, and people aren't going to know what you had tab and you're like where is it because it's going to fall off especially in high humidity it'll start to actually just flay, f flail away um, so that's sort of um, there's a lot of different troubles right um, and we're not trying to make you archivists overnight we just want to make you more mindful and it's been my experience that especially with Rosenwald projects you guys are the ones that are gathering materials you're gathering information but you're also generating information you're creating brochures you're creating the historical documents that 50 years from now we will love to have the brochure on the opening the brochure on the reunion the information packet on the board on the fundraising that you've done the newsletter the articles the annual reports and how many of you have an archive for your project? Right? Uh, it's a trouble that we run into. We tend to forget that the papers and the things that we're generating now are the archival and historical records for generations to come. And so the idea is that as you're doing that, being mindful, being making a plan for your archival records, making sure that you have a storage area, maybe the president or the secretary of the board, make sure that you're keeping certain records and copies of promotional materials you're creating. Where are all the interviews that you're conducting going? Are they backed up? Remember I said lots of copies keep stuff safe, right, locks? So how many of you have oral history projects going on? Anybody? Just a couple of you. Where, where does that information reside? Yeah, um, sometimes snippets of it go online, right? But then a lot of times you've got this huge digital file and it's on my hard drive at my house, right? Well, what happens when my house burns down? I hope your house don't burn down. Please. Um, but the idea is that there is not a backup, right? So you need to be backing up that data. Where are all those scans? You're scanning photos, right? People are bringing you photos. You're scanning documents. You've got their report cards. You're scanning all that. Where, where does all that data reside? Right? And so uh, even though, you know, in this day and age, we're, we're not dealing so much anymore with hard uh, evidence in our hands. We're dealing a lot with digital. And it's sort of hard for us to wrap our brains around the ether, but these same preservation techniques apply. We want to make sure we're storing it where we can see it on a regular basis. We want to make sure that we use our senses. Don't just leave it there and not check on it. We need to make sure that that data is still usable and open. And you, can, you can actually gain access to it. Um, we want to make sure that we're using softwares that aren't proprietary. Um, so you want to store things in a fashion that's not going to make it so that I have to have this certain camera or this brand of software in order to open it. I want something that can be opened anywhere. If I've got a website space, what am I putting on my website and where is it backed up? Um, who's backing it up? Uh, you know, it's all these kinds of things. It's the same kinds of things. We're not just going to take our wedding photos. We're not going to take our diplomas and stick them in our garage and never think of them again, right? Well, some of us might. Um, not me, because I'm a paper person. Um, but the idea is that we have to be more mindful of our digital stuff, too. Um, and all of this kind of stuff applies. And it's just about taking that step back, 
taking that breath and trying to avoid some of these pitfalls and troubles that are easily sort of uh, easily remedied and easily avoided. Um, any questions, concerns? I think we've, yes ma'am. You talked about um, regular coffee paper. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, what was the question? Ah, the question is is the, about copy paper being neutral and the lignans and wood pulp. The idea is that um, years ago, the federal government, in infinite wisdom, sometimes the feds get it right, um, is that they wanted to make sure that all government documents are printed on acid free paper. Okay? And so they made sure that this paper is neutral. So technically, it's acid free. It doesn't go the extra extreme. It's not it's going to help absorb any of the acidity, but it's neutral. It's not going to interact. So it's a good, good storage methodology. What does go that extra mile, and you can get, um, is like business stationery. So things that has more uh, of a cotton content, more fiber, linen content, like what you'd use a resume or office stationery that has uh, sort of that watermark in it. Um, it's, it's more of a bonded paper. That has more um, archival principle to it, and it'll help absorb some of the breakdown that's going on. Um, and the acid migrates. And so um, if you're going to, if you have a lot of documents, you can actually use paper, standard copy paper to interleave in between, um, and then you can change this out, you know, but it won't, it'll be years before you need to change it out. Um, they sell pH testing pens. You can get that in the scrapbooking section of a lot of hobby stores. You can buy them online, but basically it's a color-coded system. So um, anybody do the little litmus test in, in high school chemistry, and, you, and it turned pink or blue depending on its pH, right, the little piece of paper? And it's the same thing. It's testing the acidity, and so it changes color to tell you um, if it's acidic or not. Um, so if there's ever a question, you can test. But honestly, if you're using reputable vendors, and um, then you can pretty much guarantee that you're okay. Um, you want to look for um, PAT, uh, PAT test. It's the photoactivity test for photograph storage. That means that it's not going to interact with your photographs. And if it doesn't say it, um, or if the deal is too good to be true, uh, you better question it. Um, and the idea is that you can call the company or go online and, and do their customer support and just say, you know, hey, has your product passed PAT? And they'll be like, huh? Um, or you can say, and they'll say, oh, yes, it has. Let me give you the specification. So you never know. But you just have to be a better consumer. Uh, I, I think that's a lot of, lot of ways, a lot of things. Um, and there's a lot of easy troubles, but there's a lot of difficult troubles, too. Uh, storage area. We're all out of space. We all have a lot of things, our personal stuff. And then when we take on trying to be the archive repository for a group. So that's where, you know, you can try your best to um, make plans. And I think we've, we've seen sessions on, you know, making plans for uh, fundraising, for uh, advisory boards, on how to do boards, on um, marketing and outreach, on um, grant writing. Uh, but there's not really been a lot of attention paid to what we're doing about our records and storage and planning for the documents that we're creating and the documents that we're gathering. So it's all, it's all part of it. So it's a, um, you know, the trunk of trouble is a fun way to talk about those kinds of things, but it's, it's, it can be a literal and a, and a figurative metaphor too. So, um, you, yes ma'am, you're good. Okay, what about this? Digital. Okay, um, so digital media. One of the things is that a lot of people, JPEGs break down over time. Uh, so for long-term storage, for preservation storage at the State Archives, we recommend a 600 DPI TIFF file. Now that means that your file storage has got to be ginormous because those files are huge. It is not really realistic for most people to do that. And I will fully admit I'm a branch of the State Archives, but I do not have the bandwidth to support scanning 600 DPI TIFF files for long-term preservation. So uh, we, we sort of strike a balance. Um, and if there's something that is um, really important, and I feel like if, if it's in really bad shape and if I don't get a good preservation copy, then, um, then it's going to turn to dust and I'm, I'm scared about it, then I will wait and do it at night when I won't shut everybody else down in the building. <laughs> um, I have been known to do that. Um, or um, I'm going to take the time and get it to our conservator or I'm going to get it to Raleigh office that can scan at that capability. Um, but we usually, I scan between 4 and 600 DPI, but I do store it JPEG. 
um, simply because that's a, that's a universal format. The problem with JPEG is that as you migrate computer systems, so if I scan stuff on your system and you've given it to him and he gives it to her and she gives it to him, by the time it's migrated to his desktop, it's already seen four or five different, and the computer actually throws away what it thinks is junk off a of JPEG, right? It's not trash, it's not junk, but in the computer files it thinks it is, and so it can degrade the image and the quality. So what I recommend folks is that as you're doing scan projects, scan one and that becomes sort of your security copy. It can be on the external hard drive, it can be on um, a disk, it can be on a flash drive, however you want to store it, but that that is your copy and you're never going to touch that one again. It's not going to migrate, it's not going to, it's just your storage copy. And then you can use a copy of that to make new copies, to migrate, to do, and so it's your use copy. In the archives we do that a lot. We make a, a, a sort of a security copy and then we make a use copy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do they stay safe? The external hard drives, are they safe? No. <laughs> there is nothing in technology that is safe. Um, that's one thing in the archives. We still do a lot of microfilming and a lot of preservation in microfilm. And people say, oh, that's antiquated technology. But the idea is that microfilm, if it's stored properly, can last up to 500 years. It doesn't need hardware and software. It just needs magnification and a light source. Right? Um, so for us, um, but digital, we live in a digital world. So the idea is that backing things up uh, to a cloud, but even then it's not supposedly, you know, hardcore safe. Um, putting things on a flash drive, how many of you ever washed a flash drive? Yeah, that's not good. Um, you know, a lot of times people store things on disk. Well, disk gets scratched. So um, a hard drive, if it's not exercised on a regular basis, it can seize up. Um, so there's lots of issues with technology too. So the idea is that there's no, there's no, you know, fail-safe answer for everything. All you can do is do the best that you can and just know that you've done every step that you can possibly do. Um, sometimes we win them, sometimes we don't. Um, one of the things I recommend is um, just doing maybe a monthly check on your storage. Well, a lot of times people have stuff stored off-site uh, at a storage unit and so well, uh, you know, maybe once a month someone goes and checks it out to make sure you don't have a problem, make sure there's not flooding, make sure you don't have uh, bugs and pests and things. Um, and the same thing goes with your electronic data. If it's digital, make sure that somebody's checking it. Um, it's not that you're using that file, you're not migrating anywhere, you're just opening it up making sure it's still, still usable and readable. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. And, and you know, and you're like, oh, now she's telling me I've got to make six cups. No. Um, it's hard to do. So you just do what you can. You pick and choose. That's what the handouts. It's a lot of basic common sense, do's and don'ts, things that you're just going to strive for. Um, what about getting libraries who might have their own digital storage or digital libraries? Sure. All right, the question was about digital storage, like use it, partnering with someone. The problem is, is that when you start partnering with storage, um, you can, it's a slippery slope. Um, sometimes then you don't have as much access to your material if that's the only place it's at. The other thing is that then they're under constraints for storage space because they're limited in what they have. So like at the State Archives, if you wanted to give me copies of all of your stuff, I really can't take that because it's not an out and out gift to me. I don't own it and it's going to take up my valuable server space. Does that make sense? So you may run into problems, but then you may have a partner, someone on your board or someone in your community that owns server farms and is more than happy to give you a server space or is a business partner and will give you X amount of gigs of storage space for your project. Um, so you never know until you ask, right? Um, and so, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask the library. Maybe they're really into this project and they're excited about what you're finding um, and so they want to have storage. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. But you are going to run up against a lot of people just don't have the space or the room because they're trying, they're struggling to store their own. Any other questions, concerned? I've ta tackled a lot. There's a lot of trouble, y'all. <laughs> we, all, we all have troubles. The, the basic things I want to leave you with is that just do the best you can. Be, be more mindful, be more cautious. As you are moving forward in your projects, know that you're creating the records that researchers in the future are going to want to know about. They're going to want to know about these conferences. They're going to want to know about the notes. They're going to want to know about all the people that have been involved. Um, and, 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 you know, and that's the kind of thing that, that you know, as preservationists, and I run into this all the time, 
uh, I work with preservation folks. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, always realize the impact that they're having on the community. And, um, and it's about, you know, being your own advocates. You know, we're advocating for the schools, we're advocating for our communities, but we also need to have our advocate for our archives too and our, our documents and treasures because that's how we learn. These books about Julius Rosenwald, these books about Booker T. Washington, without the documents and without the photographs, would they mean as much to us? Probably not, right? The photographs of the Rosenwald schools, it, it's powerful. Images can be powerful. Documents can be powerful. I've seen people cry. I've seen people get upset. I've seen people get angry. I've seen people try and steal. I mean, um, sometimes they try and steal. Um, but the idea is that, that, that even though it's just a slip of paper or simply a, a photograph, it can mean a lot and it can really be powerful. So being more mindful and being preservationist for our documents and treasures will help you in the long, time, uh, long term and, uh, and, and you're a different type of preservationist that way. So, yes, ma'am. I sure do. Uh -huh. I've got lots of them. I came prepared. But I, we got plenty of handouts. My contact information is there. There is uh, do's and don'ts. There are, uh, there's probably more than you could ever care to know. Well, you can store in a jump drive, but I wouldn't do long-term. That wouldn't be the only place I stored it. I would have a couple so that one maybe goes in a safety deposit box or one's at your house and one's at another board member's house or one's at your sister's house. So even if you're not working on a Rosenwald project, your own personal photographs and things, making sure maybe a relative that lives in a different state gets a copy of the important documents so that there, there's, so if something catastrophic happens in one location, inevitably it'll still be okay in the other. I might keep it on different types of media. The question, uh, so in the, in the archives, we typically keep things on a server, um, and uh, that's sort of a network server, so that's sort of our master server. And then we also keep like a used copy on the hard drive that's attached, it's an external hard drive, just plugs into the computer. And then I keep, I put a disk with the scans on it in the collection itself. So that I have it in three different locations. My server is backed up to Raleigh and Raleigh's server is backed up to mine so that they're talking to each other. So the data is going to be somewhere. So at most, if something happened, I'm going to lose maybe a month's worth of scans. It's not going to be catastrophic, right? I'm going to be able to back it up. I'm going to be able to pull up something that was backed up. I recommend backing your data up. A lot of times we take lots of pictures. We put them on the computer. We might upload a few to Facebook or Flickr, and then we forget to, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get around to that. I'm going to get around to putting them on the computer. Oh, I'm going to upload those and put them on the website. Oh, I, you know, oh, I totally meant to put those in the next newsletter. So we start amassing this pile of to-dos, right? So the idea is that just do the best you can, making copies, making sure that you're storing in multiple locations or with multiple people, especially with the Rosenwald project. The more people that have access to images, the more information you can get. Um, you know, so the idea is that you have community events, always have somebody taking pictures and then making sure that you upload those to a Flickr or social media or website so that you're documenting what you're doing. We also archive websites at the State Archives, you know. So as state agencies archives, uh, their website presence changes, we're archiving websites. Have you ever thought about archiving your website? No, right? It's so much my mind. Um, so there's so much going on. So the idea is that we can't do it all. You just do what you can, and you use the tools, you try and do the best and be the best stewards you can. I don't want to stick around. I, I, I know I've thrown a lot at everyone. Uh, I've got another half hour or so. I'll be here. If you all have specific questions or items, I'll be more than happy to help you out. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah. VHS, yeah. 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 And that's the technology is uh Yeah, you have to make plans for migrating your data. So the question is about um you know, as technology becomes obsolete. So it used to be that you would record an interview on a cassette tape, right? Um, and you had that cassette tape. Well, now we're having to transfer and migrate that cassette tape to digital and to WAV files so that people can look at them and listen to them on their computers. The other thing, we used to do a camcorder, right? Used to video, and you had a hard video, VHS or beta. <laughs> beta went away real quick. But you have VHS tapes, right? So we're actually having to migrate VHS to more digital format. So the idea is that even though, um, 
technology becomes obsolete, you have to sort of plan and know that, okay, if this becomes obsolete, I might need to migrate. We might need to put some money into migrating this data. That's why I said using uh, you know, JPEGs as just a, a pure JPEG form, not using a special software, not using you know, uh, special kinds of hardware, uh, certain scanners. Um, you can only use, uh, only open the files using their software and things. So that you need to make sure that you're just um, being more mindful of those kinds of things. So as technology changes, you can migrate the information. One of the issues I run into is I have a lot of interviews from the 70s on reel-to-reel -reel, uh, reel -reel tape. And, um, and those are really notorious. They have what they call sticky shed syndrome. And what's happening is, is that film itself is breaking down and becoming sticky. Um, and, um, and so they're breaking down, but there's no machine. <laughs> we don't have a machine to transfer it. So we're having to contract out with vendors, which means money, which means I have to phase it in and I have only, I can, only X number of dollars can be used towards that. So, so we have to sort of um, prioritize our collections. So that's why, you know, if I have things in lots of different formats, um, I may start to, I may be trying to hedge my bets, but it can get kind of crazy at times. So if I have something on a hard drive, I have something on a disk and I have something on a flash drive, then at least I've got some different formats to work with. So if the flash drive goes bad, I've got the hard drive. If the hard drive goes bad, I've got the disk. If the disk goes bad, but I, you know, so you, you're just trying to hedge your bet. So if something happened to the data, something, uh, I don't know. I have what I lovingly call technical voodoo. <laughs> and uh, pretty much anything technology oriented that I go near, <laughs> I don't even have to touch it. It goes, oh no, <laughs> and it freaks out. So I have actually crashed three hard drives at the archives. Um, I'm, I'm not proud of that. Uh, I think it must have, I don't know if it's, I, I, there's something about me. It, it interacts with technology in a very bad way. It's probably my mechanical skills. I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's a major issue. So I always back up stuff. I always have a backup copy. The other thing is, is that I don't keep just one copy of a brochure or a pamphlet, I keep three. We keep one as a use copy, one as our security copy, and one as a display copy. So if I want to put on an exhibit, if I want to put on a display at the, at the Civic Center or at the library, I can have a display copy, but I still have a research copy, and I still have a pristine copy. Um, is, but that just starts adding up to the paper, right? Um, <laughs> I'm also a hoarder. No, um, the idea is that there's a lot. and and. It's about just trying to use common sense and thinking about things. Do I want to be slumped down in a chair? No, I want to be nice and supported. I want to have a good environment. Same thing with our paper. Our paper doesn't want to be slumped down in a box. It wants to be supported in a folder. We like a nice, cool, and decent temperature. Not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, not too moist. Same thing with our documents and photographs. They like it just right, right? And so if we can kind of just start to think in those terms. Do I want somebody using this thing on me? No. <laughs> uh, you know, so it seems really ridiculous and silly, but it actually will start to work. And you're going to remember me doing it. You're like that crazy girl. Um, do you want people, you know, uh, rough housing with you and, and like get your stuff together? No, you want somebody to handle you gently and nicely. Um, do you want a mechanic who's been working in the car all day to come give you a hug? No, right? It's grease. You don't want all that. Same thing. You want good, clean hands when handling. So. If you just sort of think very comically uh, about the trunk of trouble as you move forward, I think you're, you're well on your way to being great preservationists of your archival treasures. So um, if people want to come up with individual questions, that'd be great. I have my cards. But I thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and, um, and look forward to all the archival stuff that you'll have next year. It's exciting. Thank you. Thank you.